For the farmers and the producers and the makers What we even here for? Occasionally I ask it I know it's more than struggling Anticipating the casket Reap what we sow I'm Trying to fill up my basket Life's a plantation I self-law and master Over the plot I've been granted On this planet Now we're slanted Cause the chosen been supplanted But if you overstand it It was spoken Fractured but we ain't broken Even though some Would rather play the role of token We growing through the essence of a presence We carry the blood of gods We carry the mind of peasants Rich black gardens Future look more like Eden Multiply seeds like the seed banks in Sweden Rep my planners on plan according to season Be one code Switching it up is treason Black power Family what we eat Either we get fed or we feed Be one act What's growing on? What's growing on? What is growing on? My name is John Henry Harris. We also have Farmer Brown, the MC, and this is B1 Ag, the Daily Bread Podcast. Here at B1 Ag, we focus on agricultural production as it pertains to uh, economics, health, food, nutrition, production, and education, all for the Black family and for the Black community. Welcome, Black, to the garden. Now, we've been talking a lot about the supply chain disruptions and the food shortages on our program. These are, you know, very important issues that affects the quality of food that we get and also the amount of food that is available. Now, when we throw in inflation, which is the rising prices and cost of food, along with these uh, supply chain disruptions, it becomes very uh, apparent how you know, scarcity is gonna drive up the prices of this food. However, the supply chain disruption, um, just apart from the super containers sitting in the ports, we're not, most people don't think about the food spoilage and how that contributes to the amount of food that is not available for us to eat. And here today, we're gonna talk about that Uh, food spoilage, and also another unintended problem that comes with that food spoilage, which is the bugs uh, that become invasive in the food or produce from the spoiling food. So today we're going to really focus and talk about bugging out, insects making the food and supply chain problems worse. From Brown. Let's talk about it, bro. First, I just like to say peace to the B1 family. Hope everybody's doing well. So according to the USDA, FDA regulators inspected less than 2% of the food shipments that were imported to the U.S. The FDA, Food Drug Administration, this is who's in charge of making sure everything that we're consuming is is uh, is, is fit for human consumption, inspected less than 2% of the food shipments that were imported to the U.S. When we think about food imports, and so uh, here at B1 Ag, we like to be codified. And so I put this number out here, uh, 80%, 80 to 90% of our seafood was imported. And so there has been newer information. That was was what I got in undergrad. And so it's actually 62 to 65% of our seafood is imported from overseas. 62 to 65% of seafood. When we think about crops, uh, 57% of the crop production workers are from other countries. And about 50% of the crops that we eat, you know, this would be some of our vegetables and fruits are imported. Saying that to say, when we're talking about bugging out, when we're thinking about the uh, shipping supply disruptions, you know, stagnancy allows for these bugs, you know, the scientific term insects to grow. What does this mean for our food security family? I look forward to deep diving into this discussion. Let's just make it take a common sense look at what's going on with our food system. We have all these shipping containers that are stuck at the ports. Piled up in in these shipping containers, 
there are agricultural products as well. Now, think about if you have like these type of containers in your in your refrigerator. Eventually, those products will spoil. They will turn bad as they are in these plastic containers. You can see the green mold and mildew starting to grow. For fresher products, the shelf life is even shorter. Like, look at these bananas, you know, that are beginning to rot. And those will can those will produce fruit flies and other bugs. This is what's going on in our, you know, in those shipping containers containing products, agricultural products. Now, in a, in a Fox News report, uh, this uh, the harsh reality is that agricultural food products like flour, rice, beans, and spices, these are especially uh, fertile grounds for insects to thrive. And they are causing a problem because the more products that you have to throw out and throw away, that means that's less food available for our grocery shelves. And this is a quote uh, from the Fox News article. And this is uh, Mark Vanderwerp of Rose Pest Solutions. He says that we import billions of dollars worth of agricultural goods into this country. And some of those come in with bugs. Your enemy is time. So if you buy something, you let it sit for months and months and months. And if there is something alive in there, it will hatch and it will have time to complete its life cycle. Make and have kids if there are a couple of them in there. So suddenly what looks like a clean black bag of flour, if you give it a few months, it will in fact have a bunch of beetles in it. Now that drives the supply, that drives down supply while the demand stays high. The more you have to throw away, the less product makes the shelves and the more you have to pay. You know, it's a very direct linear problem and it only means less food for us to eat. We all have to eat. Uh, when we think about the UN, so there are a lot of initiatives in place now to incorporate insects into our food supply. What do you think about that? I'm not eating no bugs, bro. I mean, I would, I would, uh, I'm not eating no bugs, bro. Only way I'm eating bugs if it's just like, that's real, like, there's nothing else to eat. But what we do know, and what the USDA also knows, and is now pushing, is small scale, localized food production to achieve food security. There are a lot of initiatives that they're pushing forward to strengthen up local food, localized food production. And if the USDA is pushing for localized food production to counter these shipping disruption problems, then we as the people, we need to take note and do the same thing and start producing our own food. And we, and we need to, and we need a lot of us to do it. You know, start with your family, but each family, you know, we need, hopefully that will spread from family to family to community to region because we need this shipping container problem has been going on for a, a year. And it seems to still continue to be a problem because there aren't enough workers to ship the, the, the containers and the demand is increasingly growing, especially during these holiday seasons. This is from your FDA. So bug particles allowed in food for every one fourth cup of cornmeal, for example, the FDA allows an average of one or more whole insects, two or more rodent hairs, and 50 or more insect fragments, or one or more fragments of rodent dung or feces. This is allowed. Now, okay, we get it. You know, you're growing these crops, uh, you put them on these shipping containers. 
Uh, they're all here for weeks at a time, months at a time. You're, we're in the crisis that we're in now as far as this uh, shipping disruption. And you only have less than 2% of these uh, receptacles are actually being checked. Absolutely. Uh, I'm glad you brought that point up because, bro, before we were uh, starting this conversation, you know, they say follow the science, but science is saying this bug looks like George Bush. So we'll call this the George Bush beetle. Uh, this bug looks like a worm, so we'll call it, you know, so we're not really getting scientific classifications of what these insects actually are. There are broader implications. They say we are, you know, you are what you eat. Absolutely. You know, we think, you know, uh, not to get biblical, but we can't avoid it. We think about these plagues. We think about these plagues. Why do we find ourselves in a situation where 65% of our food is getting imported in from around the world when we're surrounded by arable land to where we could produce our food? We know every single one of us has to eat. But yet, you know, uh, when it comes to melanated people, only 1.4% of us are classified as primary operators. Uh, when we start to break it down into the urban uh, communities, uh, when we're more condensed as a people, a lot, you know, obviously a lot of us aren't just getting up, raising our own food. So this is why we try to blow the trumpet. This is why we try to beat the drum. Of, hey, y'all, we need to get into food production. Uh, peace, Sister Sinclair. And so, you know, here at B1Ag, we try not to throw shade, right? You know, we try to be codified. We try to look at instead of what somebody is doing to us or not doing for us, what can we do for ourselves? You know, over the last year and a half, we've been we've been told that the FDA, you know, follow the science. You know, if this is going to be approved for human consumption, once the FDA gives its uh, seal of approval, this is good to go. It's as good as gold. And so, like I said, when you think about something like food, and you know, once again, we're kind of being abstract now, but I want the imagination to come in when we're thinking about food. Less than two percent of the food that's coming from elsewhere is being checked. I think there's a statistic. I don't know if I have it in front of me. There's uh, 8,600 food quality inspectors in North America, and this is meat quality, and about 6,300 uh, inspection factories. And this is just with meat. Some of these factories literally get uh, tons, tens of thousands of tons of meat today to inspect. And so if I'm checking all of them, if, if I have all of my workers inspecting the meat, who do I have inspecting the, the grains? Who do I have inspecting the actual plants? Who do I have expecting all of these shipping containers that just keep getting clogged up on all of these ports, on all of the coastlines? And so you can see how uh, th this last year, this pandemic has, has affected these. And so do we now have more people working these ports? Are more people taken out of this equation, uh, maybe because of their aversion to certain uh, mandates? And so I hope the families understand what we're saying. We're trying to be respectful of the platforms that we've been fortunate to uh, bring our content to. But a lot of these things, they're not isolated situations, and they all go together for food security. We understand that the communities we come from many times, most of the times, are negatively affected by all of these disruptions. This is why we continuously pr uh, promote HealthyBlackFood.com, amongst others. And this concept is understanding, okay, since you know, since I may can't depend on the FDA to tell me what's quality, maybe I need to know from a seed what good food is supposed to look like, what organic natural food is supposed to look like. It's one thing, okay, I see this food once I get it off the shelf at the store. It's one thing, okay, I see this food once I get it from a market. But there's nothing like knowing what the whole process looks like to where as a consumer I know if I'm getting something good or if I'm getting squacked. This same FDA, as you as we stated, <clears throat> allows an average of one or more whole insects, two or more rodent hairs, fifty or more insect fragments, or one or more fragments of rodent dung for every quarter cup of cornmeal. Those don't sound like crackerjack prizes to me. You know, though those are not lucky charms. Can y'all feel me? It's like, that's one thing I loved about, you know, growing my own food, my grandfather. I know what I, I knew what I was eating. 
that cow, I knew what that cow ate. I fed it. I watched it grow from a calf to a full grown cow. We made sure that we fed the best grains, fed it uh, corn stalks, corn that we grew, that we ate as well. So it's it's not like we took, there were no shortcuts taken. But when you're dealing, when you're dealing with the FDA and this a large that such a large quantity of food, they're making a lot of shortcuts because they have to. And those shortcuts equal poor food quality that gets to your dinner table. So we really need to look at what we're eating, where our food is coming from. That's even why the USDA is really pushing, you know, localized food production. So they don't have to ship it so far. So they don't get stuck on shipping containers. And so much food is lost just to waste and spoilage. Let's deep dive. Let's deep dive. And so, you know, we're in a capitalist society, you know, money talks. And so, you know, we're not obviously we, we're coming up on this information because media decide to put it out. Right. Most people don't get into capitalism to take a loss, meaning if I'm somebody that's that's in, involved in this business, <laughs> dragging us, drag them to the river, though. If you're somebody within this system that you know i got some sort of business dealing with with china or somewhere where i'm importing this food i don't want to take a loss and so i'm gonna get it off somewhere where do you think this low quality food 11 times out of 10 is gonna go to right and if you think if you're really looking at profit thing i know okay if i'm consistently hitting these certain zip codes and what we'll call these red lines area red lined areas if i'm constantly hitting them with this low quality food I'm going to have a consistent group of people that's going to consistently have pre-existing health conditions. Meaning if I want to, con uh, I'm not going to say control. If I want to take care of you as your uh, governing body, I'm always going to have a base of you in need because I know you're not going to go out and grow for yourself. If I'm a, a pharmaceutical company and I know, okay, some of y'all got jobs and you got health insurance and I know the zip code where you live, you're going to get this lesser quality food that hasn't been expected I'm going to have a consistent base of uh, people who just want to be healthy. And I can consistently sell you these, these band-aids. I can consistently sell you these, uh, this health care, prisons, black school, and poor hoods. I mean, you know, uh, like my grandfather says, keep it simple, stupid. And that's what it is, family. Uh, you know, I, I try to keep from dancing around things and talking around it. I'm trying to be as, as understanding as possible, but this is serious business. Uh, we came across this article a couple of days ago. We had talked about it uh, a few months back because the World Health Organization now, you know, in their 2030 plan is saying, OK, since we're going to have about nine billion people on the planet, maybe the alternative source of protein is going to be insects. Uh, we think to the Bible, I think John the Baptist, they ate locusts, right? I imagine if you get in a hunger situation, you'll eat whatever is available that's not going to kill you. Uh, here at B1 Ag, we like to be optimistic uh, as we look towards the future. Uh, we do have to have these discussions to understand what is actually on this game board here. It's one thing, okay, uh, I don't have enough food coming in, but what happens when the food that you have coming in is contaminated with insects, uh, mealworms, you know, all sorts of different beetles? You know, because wherever they're coming from, they're bringing a bit of whatever uh, – microbes bacteria viruses from wherever they're coming from we we've seen the effect of all of the uh of, of of viruses when you got animals and other living organisms involved we've seen that effect right it creates these pandemics and so when we think about these underlying health pandemics that can be caused by some of this food that we get imported there is something we can do about it family and so it's not like we're in a situation where we're just at the mercy of whoever's shipping it each of us have the opportunity wherever we're at, whether we're in an apartment, whether we're in a duplex, whether we're in a, a, a hood, whether we're in the suburbs, there's something we can do to be more interactive within the food system, wherever we're at. Maybe you can't grow, but maybe I'm somebody that's just connecting the people that grow to the people that process. Maybe I'm somebody, since I see the less than 2% of the food coming in from elsewhere isn't getting checked, 
I'm going to work on building this local food system where there's more of us per container that's able to check this food. And so there are many, you know, when we talk about ag being a game of niches, there's so many different niches just within the way we eat. Because I guarantee as the population grows, as the demand, as you have more people ordering food from home, the quality in the food that you're receiving is going to decline. Uh, we keep hearing these stories of a lot of people just uh, quitting their jobs. When we think about the restaurants, we know consider what is it, 85% of Americans eat out at least three to four times a week. And so once again, all of this is going to go into food quality. Uh, there was a, a, a person a few weeks ago, there was a viral video from Popeye's where somebody was showing where all these rats were just running up and down the wall. Uh, I'm not here to cape for Popeye's. Uh, you know, you really can't even make a justification for that. But saying that to say, if you're somebody that doesn't cook or doesn't prepare your own food or don't have a local food system, you don't get a CSA share, you don't have a relationship with a local farmer, uh, you haven't worked in a cooperative with other like-minded individuals, maybe that Popeye's is the only thing you have to eat in your neighborhood. So once again, here at B1 Ag, we like to come with solutions. And that solutions is learn how to grow your own food. <laughs> Just some illustrations uh, for what this looks like. Here you have illustrations of your local and regional producers. Now, these can be your, you know, your your farmers, uh, you know, just food producers. This can be you, whatever food you're producing for you and your family being able to produce enough food to feed your family first, send this food to food hubs where they can aggregate, separate, distribute, and also market this food and get it to the consumers and the wholesale buyers. This is a food system. We need to create these for ourselves amongst our community, our families, and our regions. Like this is paramount. This is what we, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do because, um, again, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of eating rat feces. I'm not a proponent of eating insects in my in my cornbread. You know, whether it's in, in the cities, growing on top of on top of uh, buildings, if that's in the hood, and these are rundown hoods. You know, turning those into food production centers. Whether you're just in a neighborhood or, or, or a community, just getting your high tunnels, growing your own food. All of this must be normalized. All of this must be normalized. The stressed areas of town, go ahead and plant some food in those vacant lots. Take your time, take the time to plant some food in those vacant lots. Instead of producing crime and, you know, this bad activities, produce food. Turn these areas of town where they're like, oh, that's a bad side of town into, whoa, that's a that's a green side of town. We can literally transform our neighborhoods produce more food and build our own food system, which is a necessity for us moving forward as this shipping container uh, crisis continues, food shortages, and as this continues to fester, it's only getting worse. Those shipping containers, they, they contain a lot of different products, but they also can contain food as well. That's why this is a problem. So to get ahead and stay ahead of these issues, that's why they're saying localized, small scale food production is the way to go. And this will help us be more food secure because we all got to eat. We Bro, we were talking eat. about these xenobots, right? Uh, you know, uh, this, this was over the last three or four days. And, you know, anytime science like this is released to the public, okay, we we know the powers to be, or powers that shouldn't be, been working on this for 20 years, decades. 
So these xenobots are basically, so the ones that they reported were uh, cells taken from frogs. They look like Pac-Man. But the purpose of these xenobots is they can perform functions. AI literally programs these otherwise natural organisms to perform functions. And so this is why they're classified as robots. Saying that to say, so, okay, I'm, I'm trying as best as I can to play devil's advocate. Okay, we don't have enough people working these ports. We don't have enough people uh, inspecting the meat. We don't have enough people that is inspecting the food. I got an idea. You know, instead of repairing these people who I've been uh, decimating over the last few decades, and instead of just actually paying people an equitable wage, we'll create these robots. And so the question lies, and, and I'm being very serious, do you trust a robot inspecting your food? Because once again, when we think about compensatory logic, if you see a problem, you have to meet that problem with the equal amount of a solution. And so here when we have this B1I conversation, it isn't just about talking about the problem. It's about, okay, y'all, we really need to do something about this yesterday, last week, last year. Because this is a problem, you know, as the world population continues to expand and we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply, right? And so that's not a bad thing. You know, people uh, being born into the, into the world, that's a good thing. But when we think about now, what are we doing once we're here? What is one of the first things that any living organism does? One of the first things a parent teaches offspring to do is to feed itself. If I'm a bird, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna bring these first few worms up here just to get your taste palate going. But once your wings start flapping, son, daughter, I'm gonna need you to go down here and hunt. Uh, humans, mammals, it's no different. You know, so at the end of the day, when we think about the broader economic system, there, what do they say? There's no business like grow business. How do we feed ourselves? How do we make sure that the food that we're eating is quality? No other entity around this world is going to care more about the quality of food we eat than us. I don't, I don't think the people in uh, South America, in Asia, you know, whatever we want to call these places are sitting like, now how are we going to make sure those melanated people across the ocean are eating healthy? Because technically we have the same factions trying to give us mystery meat. We have the same factions wanting to sell us things that we don't know where the origin of it is. So once again, the solution is at least learning how to grow our own food. Even if we don't have large farms to grow it on, we at least understand the process. And, you know, what is it? As above, so below. What I understand it took for this one seat in this pot in my window that I started in 2022, I now know who to look for. I know the products that grow well in the region where I'm at. Uh, because I bitch, because I really tapped in, I realized, okay, I need to reach out to people in other regions where I can drive to. I don't have to wait on a shipping container from over the ocean. I don't have to wait for a, for a, a 18-wheeler to come across the country. I can literally, with my, because I always know who to call at when it comes to have a good time. I know to holler at when I want the plug, you know, for some clothes. We have the plugs for everything we want to do, but my question is, as a melanated family, are we plugged in with the producers? And not just being plugged in with those who are already producing, but are we ourselves becoming producers, becoming produce-minded, production-minded over just being consumers? It's very important, y'all, because we all have to eat. Healthyblackfood.com. This is just one. This is just one avenue for you to learn how to grow your own food. Healthyblackfood.com. Sign up. Make this a family. Make this a family. A family event. You know. Make normalize having a family garden. Normalize y'all. You know, harvesting this food, growing this food together, harvesting this food together, and eating together as a family. You know, this should be normal. This should be everyday, you know, everyday activity, not necessarily just ordering food from Grubhub or your or your, your restaurants or going through the drive through, but actually growing your own food and eating it together. That's security. That's power. There was a brother reached that homestead in the hood and he asked the question, you know, do I have to pay money? Or, you know, do I have to, you know, get an invite to be involved in this organization? Uh, B1 Ag isn't an organization, right? B1 Ag is an idea. 
B1 Ag is this concept, it's black first agriculture. We think about feeding ourselves first. We wanna get so good at this activity of producing food that we're not only able to feed ourselves, but in whatever this world turns into, if it's all digital currency, whatever it turns into, we're good. We know how to feed ourselves, which is a natural need. And we have a surplus to sell within our communities, within our regions, around the world. So to answer that question, brother, no, this isn't just an organization you got to pay money for, right? Like there's so much more wealth to be gained from sharing information. If you have information, if you have a skill set, wherever you, you're at, we encourage you, reach out to us at b1aghiphop at gmail.com. The whole purpose of this is to have the discussion. You know, you can probably tell I like talking, but I love listening. I would much rather listen than to talk. Our goal here, like I said, is to blow the trumpet. Hey, this is a very serious conversation we want to have with people, not just where we live at. I'm in Kentucky. You're in South Georgia. Uh, we got some people in New York, California, Texas. We need to have these conversations. You know, it's great to have these conversations in the chat. But once again, reach out. Let's have broader conversations. Let's really identify some strategies that can be employed wherever we're at. You know, unfortunately, we're in a world where there's a lot of exploitation. Uh, you know, our, the way we make our money to be very transparent, we do like to sell our class, healthyblackfood.com. Uh, very modest, right? But once again, it's this concept of let me not trip over somebody else trying to get to this bag. You know, both him, uh, John Henry and myself, okay, we, we're into marketing. Uh, we're, we're, we're into academics. We understand statistics. We understand communications. So there lies our niche. Let us not try to play middleman between somebody who's producing. More so, how do we take what we're good at and add that to somebody who's producing? How do we then meet people who are into uh, community emergency preparedness? How do we take this into people who are in the military that understand logistics, understand how uh, you know strategic uh, strategy works? How do we take this into people who understand real estate, who understand investing and have this broader conversation? This is what this is all about, family. We have solutions. We have solutions and we have choices. But all of this starts with this seed of understanding, okay, we need to feed ourselves. Uh, when we have these stories, when we bring these stories to the family, it isn't to be in this distressed mindset like, oh, my gosh, what can I do? It's like, no, hey, y'all, this is what's going on. Uh, we're not making this up. This isn't tinfoil. This isn't conspiracy theory. And we try to break down like these are the statistics around it. And we understand anytime there's some sort of negative statistic that affects the corporation of North America, it's going to affect the melanated community worse. And so instead of always being, instead of being a victim of circumstance or not being prepared, our concept is learning how to plant these seeds so we can stay ready so we don't have to get ready. And that's what you call survival, y'all. At the end of the day, that's what it's about, survival. And really, beyond survival, thrival, thrivalism. And one way we're trying to survive in this uh, digital space is we have to fight against that algorithm. We got to fight against this algorithm by pushing the black algorithm. Now, when I play this, y'all, I really want y'all to pay attention and look at the faces. Look at the smiles, look at the community, look at the love that's being shown just from people growing, sharing, and producing food. Pushing the black algorithm, ancestors, they mastered the systems. We raising your bosses, no victims, planting that knowledge curriculum. Placing the boots with the nutrients, the darker the very black new begin. Not from receipts like I'm Julian. The streets with that food like Peruvian. Trapping the merch and the fruits and them veggies. CSA boxes, my package is heavy. Ship across town in the bed of my Chevy. Printing the up, growing hard, but it barely. If you stay ready, you ain't gotta scramble. Battle black like farmers and growers, no gamble. We came in our bank cause the game is in shambles. Blessed with that melanin, carry the mantle. Mothers and fathers of civilization. Black to the garden with food cultivation. Building back better through back in the B1 community going with the nation Genetically designed to be the dopest Stoke that growth mindset Codified, now we focus Farming on track on track on track Be the fan, break bread with them Pushing that back on track on track Pushing that B1 algorithm Now we're on track on track on track
Watch me get em, watch me get em Pushing that Pushing that B1 algorithm Rhythm Be the fan, break bread with em Pushing that Pushing that B1 algorithm Rhythm Watch me get em, watch me get em That Pushing that B1 algorithm Rhythm Watch me get em, watch me get em That Pushing that B1 algorithm There it is. Let's get those prints in the mud. Let's get our hands in that dirt. Let's get our feet. Let's put our footprints out there in the garden. Thrivalism. So, at the end of the day, these uh, shipping containers, they do have food in them. This food is, this food is spoiling. This food is spoiling, y'all. And it's beginning, you know, they're producing a lot of bugs as well. So as these uh, shipping containers continue to stay stacked up at these ports, this food is spoiling. You know, this food will eventually, if it's not thrown out, in efforts just to make something off of it, it's going to make it to our zip codes. And as uh, Sister Cherry Wildfire pointed out, if it, if it doesn't come directly to our zip codes, it's going to make it to the prisons, the black schools, and the hoods, which still equates to uh, the B1 family. And we want to make sure that we're eating the best foods proper as possible, because that's not, again, it's about more than surviving. We're talking about thriving. And remember, out of every 100 of those shipping containers that come here, only two, less than two, are actually checked by a human being. For every 100 shipping containers imported to the U.S. to one of these ports, less than two are actually inspected. Meaning when a truck does come by, to pick it up and take it to where it's going, you know, you do your scanning, you're going to get what's on that shipping container. The way to ward against that, only two of those. I want, I want the family to contextualize this. Only two of those out of every hundred actually get checked. And we're in an age of where mandates are making a lot of essential workers decide they're not going to go to work. And so that means there's more work on the people who are still at work. And one just has to warn to the efficiency of, are you going to go through every package, every container and be able to see, now does, does this have a whole bunch of rat feces in it? You know, is this riddled with bugs? You're not going to find that out till it gets to your corner store. You're not going to find that out till it gets to the grocery store. And if we're in a zip code where it's a majority of us, guess where it's going to go? But everywhere we're at, we're on a land mass of 1.9 billion acres. And that's just in the lower 48. 75% of us only live on 3% of the land. We're surrounded by a garden. To the degree that we decide that we're going to take more control over our food security. Absolutely. Everything ties together. It seems like an abstract conversation, right? We've been so diverted from how intertwined our food system is. And like I said, it was our ancestors that made the most sustainable food system. They got so good at it, the people around the world wanted to enslave our ancestors. But because we learned the lessons of the past, we realized, okay, we're going to recodify around feeding, first feeding ourselves. Then with our surplus, we'll feed people who want to buy this, this perfectly produced produce, this perfectly raised meat that we know every bit of what went into it. We didn't spray it down with chemicals that's gonna make it uh, have these horrible effects on your body. You know, we put that black magic into it. We make it, a, we make it a good, healthy product that feeds us first and we take our surplus and sell it, sell it. So once again, the brother said thrivalism. We're about thrivalism and it starts with the seed. And if you really, really want to know something, what do the people need to do, Farmer Brown? 
If you really want to know something, let's plant that seed of intent and learn how to grow something. It's the beginning of the week. Let's run through this week, y'all. I'm talking about let's hit the truck stick and just forge through this Monday and make this whole week productive, full of love. And I'll see you at the I'll see you at the harvest, y'all. It's John Henry Harris. We have Farmer Brown MC. This is B1 Ag Dealer Bread Podcast. See you, see you soon. Peace.